All right, now that our leader is here, let me uh, welcome you. I'm Simon Levin from Princeton University. I'd like to begin by thanking Jill Sackler, and who's up front here, and the Sackler family for making these uh, colloquia possible. This is the third one I've been to, and I can tell you that they're always terrific experiences. They're even better if you get your papers in on time to Allison so we can get the special issue out. You, uh, they will be published in the PNAS and they uh, um, make for a very good series. I'd also like to thank Susan Marty before she closes the door and Jennifer Clements and their staff for all of the arrangements in getting us here and especially to uh, Allison Galvani and my colleagues uh, who have been her assistants in helping to put this uh, colloquium together. So welcome and to all of you here. Um, this symposium, this colloquium is on coupled human and environmental systems. Let me first of all thank the various agencies that have funded my work. <coughs> We'll be coming at this problem from a variety of different directions. The central problem that societies face, I think, is in how we achieve a sustainable future. How do we grow in positive ways without impacting the ability of future generations to have the same choices we have? But what does sustainability mean? It means different things to different people. Um, to some, it means the stability of uh, financial markets and economic security. And even if your focus is on ecological and environmental issues, you have to be concerned about such things. It means the sustainability of energy and other natural resources. It means the maintenance of biological and cultural diversity. And as you'll hear more of when you hear later today from Gretchen Daly, but also from others, it means the sustainability of the services that we derive from ecological systems. Ecosystem services means the direct benefits that we gain, like food, fiber, fuel, pharmaceuticals. It means the indirect benefits we gain from ecological systems, like the maintenance of climate, the sequestration of toxic materials, breeding grounds for fish species. And it often mean, also means but, um, the maintenance of the ethical and aesthetic dimensions of our environment, and too often that doesn't make its way into the, into the equations, which leads to a great debate and, uh, in conservation science about how to incorporate them. So the key research questions, many of which we'll be looking at in the talks today and tomorrow, are what are the services we get from ecological systems? And how do they depend on different features of the ecosystems like biological diversity? What makes them robust or what makes them not robust? And where's the potential for losing that robustness? How can we protect the services we get from ecological systems? And in particular, as I implied in, on the previous side, slide, how do we protect the intrinsic value of systems, the things that aren't, don't have a price in, in the marketplace? In any system of this sort, we're dealing with public goods, common pool resources, issues of the commons, and so naturally there are going to be conflicts between individual interests and the collective good, and in particular between the interests of societies and nature, and I'm hoping we can explore some of those issues today. The complication is that ecosystems, the biosphere, and the socioeconomic systems with which they interact are what we call complex adaptive systems. They are obviously complex systems, but they are systems that are made up of individual agents that pursue their own selfish agendas with consequences for the whole that feed back to affect individuals. But the trade-offs between individual interests and the collective good leads to a variety of problems that we will be addressing in many different directions. Um, we, we address them in terms of climate change, and I'm sure Scott Barrett will be talking about issues of that sort. We address them when we think about vaccination strategies, which Allison has been uh, working on. We address them when we deal 
with um, antibiotic effectiveness and antibiotic resistance. There are a whole slew of problems and indeed evolutionary biology, evolution has had to face a number of such challenges uh, over the course of, uh, of time and we can learn a lot from how evolution has dealt with public goods problems. But in general, this means we need to figure out how to relate phenomena across scales from cells to organisms, from organisms to groups of organisms, up to ecosystems, the biosphere, the social systems, and to ask questions like how robust are the properties of ecological systems and social systems? How does the robustness of the macroscopic properties relate to dynamics going on on finer scales? And are the systems of interest at critical points with the potential of sudden change. Here it's about ecological systems, certainly disease systems involve outbreaks and collapses. Financial systems see collapses, and social systems may go through dramatic changes. Can we anticipate these? Come back to that. Overall, um, can we develop a theory that allows us to relate, just as in statistical mechanics, the dynamics of these coupled human and ecological systems or human environmental systems in terms of what individual agents are doing. In a book that uh, Scott Barrett edited uh, in honor of Partha Dasgupta, uh, Scott Barrett edited a, a, along with uh, uh, Eric Maskin and Scott someone else? Carl and Carl Joran Mailer. Um, Scott asked Ken Arrow and Paul Ehrlich and me to consider the problem of what, how to deal with linked ecosystems and socioeconomic systems, particularly in their nature of, as complex adaptive systems. And I don't expect you to read this whole thing, I'll just highlight part of it, but we identified in that that, they're, that dealing with the management of social and environmental systems is complicated by the fact that we've got individual agents whose behaviors drive these systems or individual nations, but with macroscopic consequences uh, that are hard to predict. And in particular, uh, I focus uh, on the last line down there, with, that this perspective emphasizes unpredictability and the need for policies that maintain the resilience and robustness of those systems. In other words, complex adaptive systems, the very nature of those undermine the potential for robustness and resilience. We rely often on insurance arrangements and cooperative arrangements among individuals, but they can collapse. The information and beliefs that people have, the social norms that that drive behaviors in society are all correlated with each other and that means there's the potential for sudden destabilization. We see this in stock markets, we see this happening in epidemics, we see this um, happening in a variety of ways in which people change their attitudes, change their behaviors um, in correlated ways and so these systems are all subject to um, systemic risk and contagion. One of the things that maybe we'll hear about today, I don't know what people are planning to talk about, is the new trends in the modeling of disease dynamics. Disease dynamics have been one of the most successful applications of mathematics to biological problems, but until recently nobody really built in, in, a, in an essential way, how individuals behave uh, during epidemics. Carlos Castillo Chavez, who's here working with a number of others, has been one of the leaders in that. In other words, the c classical SIR models of, of disease dynamics are all about hosts as islands and parasites that occupy them, but what about how does this change if individuals avoid context text during uh, outbreaks? How would this change the dynamics? and um, led by Charles Perings at Arizona State and Eli Fenichel and others, there's considerable work um, in, in this area now. 
Stock markets crash due to the collective consequences of individual actions. So too to uh, ecological systems. Martin Schaeffer's um, fascinating book of a few years ago documents that. His work largely on shallow lakes. Steve Carpenter and others have picked up on that. Many transitions of this sort, in the case of the shallow lakes flipping from oligotrophic to eutrophic states, have characteristic early warning systems signals, with the cartoon there of a ball sitting on a uh, landscape in which as the landscape changes, the stability of that ball may change and it may suddenly move to a different equilibrium. So this is a paper that I happen to have been involved with, but that Martin Skeffer has led uh, a number of such efforts called Anticipating Critical Transitions. And the focus of a lot of Martin's work has been on critical slowing down, the rate at which the ball approaches uh, its stable point gets less and less as an indicator that something's going wrong. Increasing variance in the system, much as we see in the climate systems. Increasing autocorrelation, such as we see in climate systems. And flickering between states. So for a wide variety of, of critical transitions, these sorts of early warning indicators tell us something's going wrong. And we've recently published a paper, again led by Skeffer, on early warning indicators of physiological transitions, transitions to migraine headaches, epileptic seizures, uh, atrial fibrillation. Whenever a doctor takes um, an EKG, what she's looking for are signs of this sort that, not that you are necessarily in trouble, but, you're, but, um, but your resilience and robustness have been reduced and you're at risk of, of trouble. But not all critical transitions show these signals, and Alan Hastings has been a leader working with uh, Carl Bodeger and others. Carl was a student of Alan's, and before that a student of mine documenting the fact that uh, many, or many uh, critical transitions don't show these characteristic uh, symptoms, these characteristic signals. It's the difference really between first and second order phase transitions in physics, which do not show the same properties and, and, and don't give you the same sorts of, of signals. So I think it's a very promising area, but it's an area where we need to be careful. In general, if we're going to develop approaches to sustainability, we're going to have to focus on the macroscopic print, uh, features, such as, can I boil water? Although recognizing that boiling water is, is the result of lots of molecules banging into each other and having increased energy, we need to develop statistical mechanics of our societies and of our ecosystems that let us understand the macroscopic properties as to collective consequences of large numbers of individual agents. That's basically what we do, after all, in epidemic models. And we're going to have to address the, the problems that I think are at the core of dealing with many of these issues, public goods and common pool resource problems, which are fundamental both in uh, socioeconomic systems and in ecological systems. This is a termite mound in South Africa, issues in which individuals collectively have interest in maintaining some features of these systems, but individually may not have sufficient incentive without some sort of cooperative arrangement. So how do we get there? Um, public goods and common pool resources are central in ecology. Information itself is perhaps the ultimate public good. Do we gather information for ourselves, or do we, or, or do we depend on others for it? Tumor growth is a problem involving a public good. Tumor cells begin to proliferate at rapid rates, ultimately for the harm of the, of, of the organism. But in the short run, the tumor cells outcompete the healthy cells. On the other hand, tumor cells have to produce cytokines and other compounds that are crucial to the growth. So if we can, that's another public goods problem. And if we can find ways to undermine that, and there is research going on that, that's one possible way to deal with cancer. 
plankton in the ocean produce sideriforous that help them to chelate iron and sequester other compounds. Plants and bacteria fix nitrogen, which is a public good because if a tree drops its leaves, it's available to everybody else. Antibiotics are a public good in two different ways. We all know about antibiotics and the erosion of antibiotic resistance due to, I'm sorry, the rise of antibiotic resistance due to the overuse of antibiotics. Um, vaccines are another example in which there is a public good dimension to it. But antibiotics are also a public good in their natural setting in that the plants that, uh, or the bacteria that produce antibiotics to poison enemies uh, are subject to cheating by other bacteria, for example, other E. coli, that simply develop resistance to it and free ride on, um, on the poisoning that the producers provide. So vaccination and antibiotic use, I'm sure we're hearing a lot about today, raise public goods challenges. Uh, antibiotic resistance, as you all know, is a serious growing problem. Uh, and much of it due to nosocomial infections, those you get in the hospital. The prototypical public goods are the commons that we all share. William Forster Lloyd identified that two centuries ago, but it was Garrett Hardin who termed it the tragedy of the commons. And for him, the solution was mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon. But for him, that meant a heavy role for government. Lynn Ostrom, a colleague of many of us, showed that this could be a bottom-up process in which small communities, at least, um, could band together uh, to create norms that allowed them to regulate a commons. But the real challenge is how do we extend this to the global level? Managing the commons is both an environmental and an evolutionary challenge, and human societies, as Garrett Hardin said, as Lynn Ostrom showed, it depends on mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon, where users self-organize to develop norms and sanctions and to maintain cooperation so that resources aren't overexploited. That works in small societies. The real challenge for us, and we'll hear about this, I hope, from Scott Barrett, is whether cooperation can be extended to the global level. How do we do that? Lynn Ostrom talked a lot about polycentricity in the last works that she did, creating modules that were building blocks. Anyway, there are lots of challenges, lots of opportunities, and hopefully this Sackler Symposium will allow us to begin addressing issues of this sort across a range of systems. Thank you. Welcome all of you here. Allison, how do we proceed now? Um, do I just introduce Alan? Okay. So, our first speaker today is Alan Hastings, um, distinguished professor at the University of California, Davis. I've known him since he was a graduate student. Before. Since before he was a graduate student, right. And so, Alan, it's all yours. <laughs> 